Hi, this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is for Kayla Lacavino, and uh, this is the introduction to geochemistry presentation. And, uh, and, uh, uh, this is, uh, for, uh, for Kalo Lacavino's talk, uh, for the 2021 AGU full meeting number three. And the title is Carbon as the Primary Driver of Super Reduced Explosive Volcanism on mercury evidence from graphite melt smelting experiments. Hello, everybody, and thanks so much, Gilbert, for the introduction. My name is Kaylee Yacovino, and um, as Gilbert said, I'm going to be talking to you today about carbon on mercury. So to begin, I know that a lot of folks in this session are not necessarily planetary geologists. So I wanted to first answer the question, why should an igneous petrologist care about mercury? Now, okay, there are a few cons, like we can't go there and, you know, we can't breathe there. But I would argue that the pros heavily outweigh those cons. There are over 150 likely pyroclastic deposits that have been identified on Mercury. We have both explosive and effusive, effusive volcanism that has happened there. Uh, and my favorite part about Mercury is it's absolutely bonkers chemistry. Uh, the surface chemistry is super weird. Um, it's extremely reducing. Uh, when you actually look at the measured values for the surface chemistry, chemistry versus um, fitting that into oxygen bearing species such as oxides, we find that there's actually a deficit of about 11 to 15 weight percent oxygen. So in other words, those, um, those chemicals are made up of other things like um, sulfides potentially or metals. And this is again, because the surface is extremely reducing as low as iron woostite minus eight. Um, and that means we have silicon rich SIFE metal alloys that cover an estimated 10 to 20% of the surface. I mean, what's really cool about mercury for me is that it's a geochemical end member. It's really forcing us to push the boundaries of what we can do in terms of thermodynamic modeling, in terms of experimentation, and kind of forces us to think outside the box, which is kind of fun. In this talk, of course, we're focusing on volcanism on mercury, and in particular on explosive volcanism on mercury. And so that's going to lead us to ask questions about volatiles. Where are they coming from and what are they doing? Uh, and I here have two very basic images of the two ways we can get volatiles involved in an explosive eruption. On the left, magmatically sourced volatiles, and on the right, externally sourced volatiles. Um, on the left is our sort of most, most common scenario. Um, however, hydrogen and carbon solubilities are very low at reducing conditions. Sulfur solubility is enhanced, and so some people have uh, posited potential sulfur degassing uh, being responsible for these eruptions. But of course, when the solubility is enhanced, it doesn't want to come out of the melt as well. So that also poses a problem. Um, I've noted here we cannot model this scenario well um, because our, our, our databases that, that back our thermodynamic models don't haven't been uh, calibrated at the conditions on Mercury. And so that makes this kind of fun. And is the reason why we chose to approach this um, experimentally. Um, and now really what we're looking at today is the external volatiles possibility. Mercury is known to have had a graphite flotation crust really early in its history. And that has resulted in carbon rich terrains of several weight percent carbon, uh, likely in the form of graphite. And so graphite melt interaction during um, emplacement in the shallow subsurface or on the surface could uh, not only explain where these volatiles are coming from to create explosive eruptive deposits, but also could help explain the oxygen depleted surface that we find on Mercury. Actually, we'll talk about it on this slide. So let's talk about smelting. Well, smelting is the process that we do here on Earth when we want to extract metal ores from rocks. <clears throat> and the process we're looking at is basically the mixing of graphite, with a the metal oxide from a rock, so like a magma, uh, mixing to produce CO and CO2 gas and a metal. <clears throat> and I've shown four important reactions we're going to be thinking about today. Um, just take the top one as an example, where we have gra <clears throat> where we have carbon from the graphite combining with uh, FeO in the melt. That carbon scavenges that O from the FeO complexes in the melt. 
to create CO, and that leaves us with a reduced iron metal. And we can do the same thing with silicon um, to create CO, and we can do the same thing with both of those metal oxides to create metals and CO2. And fun fact, I couldn't talk about this without mentioning that magmatic smelting naturally has been documented to occur on Earth. This is just uh, a really quick aside to show these. I couldn't do this without showing these awesome pictures. <clears throat> these are um, magmas from the Siberian traps. And on the left here, uh, you're seeing a plagioclase crystal with native iron inclusions. And on the right, uh, melt globules inside of native iron deposits. So this is something that we know does happen in magmatic settings. So we're gonna see if it is happening on Mercury. <clears throat> So, of course, the question then becomes, I'm an experimentalist, can we smelt our own rocks in the lab? Um, so we're trying to answer two main questions here for mercury. Is smelting feasible on mercury? And can we produce S, sulfur, or carbon-rich gas um, through these processes? <clears throat> so I'm sort of showing a little cartoon diagram of our experimental setup. We took three different magma compositions representing um, the Northern Plains composition of mercury with slightly different tweaks. Um, composition number one on the left was to test the most basic reactions that I showed you previously. Um, and so to simplify things, there is no sulfur and no alkalis in this composition. Our composition number two is to test whether alkalis are um, a good source for driving the smelting reaction. So there are no sulfur, there's no sulfur and there are no metal oxides. So this answers the question, are metal oxides, you know, transition metal oxides, iron, titanium, are these necessary to begin this smelting process? <clears throat> um, the third composition is the most quote unquote natural composition and it's got everything. It's got sulfur, it's got alkalis and metal oxides. So we took each of these compositions, mixed them with about 15 weight percent graphite, put them in a crucible and heated them up, ramped up temperature uh, at low pressure at about 10 millibars. Um, and then the gases that were degassed from that sample during heating up to three, 1340 degrees C um, went straight into um, a reduced gas analyzer where we measured the gases in situ during the experiments. Um, and then of course we took the solid products and analyzed those on the probe. So first off, here are the results from, um, from the solids. Um, what I'm showing you here is representative experiments, one from each um, starting composition. <clears throat> and a couple things I wanna point out to you are the presence uh, in, in the sample on the left here, sample number one, the presence of those uh, graphite, the residual graphite globs always in contact with metal blebs, the bright white blebs there. And so that's a really nice textural indicator that the smelting was occurring to create these metals, that it wasn't another reaction, that it's actually related to the presence of the graphite reacting with the melt. And the other thing I want to point out is that uh, our number sample uh, starting material number two, um, which had no transition metals, produced no metal. And so, and so we didn't see the smelting reactions here uh, occurring. So that's telling us that these transition metals, namely iron, um, are necessary to, to begin the smelting process, at least at the conditions that we studied. Um, this is really the sort of big money figure. Uh, these are the gas results. And so again, these are gases measured during heating of the sample. <clears throat> and what you're looking at again are uh, representative experiments all at a maximum temperature of 1340 degrees um, from starting material one, two, and three, color-coded here. On the x-axis, you have temperature from you know, going increasing on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, you have essentially the mass of gas that was released. And these are all at the same scale. So these are, the on the left here, I'm showing you the carbon results. This top line here is the blue composition number one, and you can see significant degassing of both CO and CO2. Uh, we see pretty good amount of degassing also from uh, starting material number three, which is this middle orange line here, both of CO and CO2. Um, and there's not really any degassing to, to be had here in, in our number two sample. And again, remember that this was the composition that also produced no metal. 
So we have no gas, no metal. It looks like smelting was not occurring in, in uh, starting material number two samples. Now I want to talk about sulfur as well because we did measure that. And again, our number three uh, composition had sulfur in it. <clears throat> and I've actually, this is at the same scale as the carbon data on the left, same plot over here. Um, and the, the data are actually plotted on this. That is how little sulfur we measured. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that sulfur degassing wasn't occurring because we're still tracking down um, what the sulfur was doing during these experiments. Um, so that's sort of yet to be seen. But what we can say is that in our experiments, that carbon was the primary volatile that was degassing. And that, of course, smelting is feasible, even expected on mercury. Of course, we came here to talk about explosive volcanism on mercury. So now what we want to do is take the results of our experiments and see if we can't use those to explain what we observe on the planet. Um, this left image here is an image of Nathir Facula, the largest pyroclastic deposit on mercury. And those bright um, areas you see there are the, the pyroclastic deposits. Now on the right, I'm showing you a plot where we have deposit radius on the x-axis. And the top plot here on the y is showing deposit frequency. Uh, so a histogram of, of deposit sizes. Nathair facula is this lone point on the right. And as you can see, the vast majority of pyroclastic deposits are less than about 20 kilometers. Now what we can do then is first take the size of those deposits and relate that to the ejection velocity required to eject a pyroclastic particle from the vent to a given distance um, on an airless body given the gravitational acceleration on Mercury. We can then take that velocity we've calculated and calculate the amount of gas, of any different type of gas, needed to propel the explosion to such a velocity. And we can do this because the gases are propelling these things via adiabatic um, expansion of the gases as they rise and explode. And so then what I've done is taken those reactions I showed you earlier um, in the talk and, comp and doing that calculation, comparing the deposit radius to the amount of carbon that would be required to degas to create enough C either pure CO in this top line, pure CO2 in this bottom line, or a 50-50 mixture um, of CO and CO2 here in this dashed line. And these uh, vertical dotted lines are the maximum average and minimum deposit sizes on mercury. And so what's really cool about this part of the plot is we can see the vast majority of deposits that live down here require less than a weight percent of carbon to smelt, to degas, to produce enough gas to create the deposit sizes we see. Um, and even at a maximum, so this image on the left, only needed about three weight percent, give or take a little bit, depending on your gas chemistry, um, of carbon to degas. And this is perfectly reasonable and consistent with what we see on the surface. The region where an athlete facula is, is thought to have about four weight percent carbon uh, in the surface. So this is plenty to explain what we see here. And so that's a really nice result. But of course, we need more than just carbon to smelt. We need iron and we need silicon in the melt. So we can do that mass balance and say, OK, same thing, how much FeO in the melt is required, and how much SiO2 is in the melt is required, assuming pure FeO or pure SiO2 smelting. So if we have both, that value is going to be lower. But what you can see is for the, the average deposit size, a little under 20 kilometers, you need less than five weight percent uh, FeO in the melt and less than three weight percent SiO2 in the melt. And again, that'll be a little bit lower than that if both of those things are being smelted. Now, when you go to the maximum deposit size or nathar facula, you need a whopping 30 weight percent FeO or 14 weight percent SiO2 to be smelted in that melt. And so that's starting to creep into unreasonable territory. And so we have to wonder to produce these very few but existent very large deposits, do we need to call upon another volatile, be it sulfur or hydrogen? So I'm going to go ahead and just leave you with my take home points here. Um, again, we, we have shown you the results of the first experiments on smelting induced degassing of mercury magmas. And we've shown that graphite melting is expected on mercurian surface and graphite smelting alone can explain almost all pyroclastic deposits on mercury. Feel free to send me an email or hit me up on Twitter if you enjoyed the sock or if you didn't. I'm happy to take feedback either way. Thanks again for spending your time with me today and I hope you have a good one.